buckle your seat belts. We're covering a lot of territory. We didn't get it through it all. I was so surprised we got through everything uh, last week, except I have to go back and do a couple things. So here's the deal, guys. Now that um, this is being recorded, <laughs> I feel like doubly accountable. And now my husband, who has never watched me teach, has seen me teach for the first time. And so I'm go I might have to make corrections along the way. <laughs> Well, Paul thinks this. I realized I said that a lot. It's my husband, Paul. For those of you who are watching who don't have a clue, it's my husband, Paul, who's been a pastor for many, many years. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to tell you is that I am not a scientist, but I have listened for years to creation scientists uh, speak. I've gone to the Creation Museum many times, so I'm sharing with you things that I have picked up. One of the things that I had never checked out that I thought about after last week was the whole story about the whale. I told you about the whale that was upright and all those different things. And you go, how can you still hold to evolution if all those things are true? So I thought, I've got to find that. So I went looking for it, and I found out that creationists used that for years. Somebody had made a drawing of it, but it wasn't accurate. So here I am to correct the story. What I found out was actually pretty fascinating. The whale was found in Lompoc, which is right next door to Santa Maria, where Paul grew up. So Paul's like, no way! It's an 80-foot whale. A whale is one of the biggest um, that, uh, fossils that they found of a whale. And it is at a 60-degree angle, but the whole, um, uh, what do you want to call it? Our tail? No, no. Well, tail the tail is down. I told you the head was down, but the tail is down. The head is up. But the, the, it's the a silt that it was found oh, in. Yeah. The strata, thank you. I was looking for that. The strata. Um, so the strata, um, it's all in one strata, but the strata was tilted up. So Andrew Snelling, who's a very uh, reputable creation uh, researcher, went to research it because he knew creationists had been using this for a long time. He went to research it to see, you know, to verify is this, you know, true. And he found that it, what it does is it still proves that it had to be a rapid burial. There are no um, bottom feeders found in with it. Um, and it had to be buried rapidly in order to be preserved. So he's got this whole very detailed report on it. Um, but in the meantime, I did find out that there are trees mm -hmm. that they have found. They're called polystrates that are uh, through all these different layers of um, you know, the earth and the uh, strata. Thank you, strata. <laughs> I'm losing my words here. Um, so um, anyway, and it's interesting that in most of the geology books, they won't talk about these polystrates because they don't know how to explain it, right? I mean, have you ever seen a tree just get slowly buried by the earth? It just doesn't happen, right? So what they know is that it had to have happened quickly. But all that to say, and there were a couple things about um, a Steve Austin's thing that he said, you know, the... the uh, different layering was laid down very quickly, but it wasn't right after uh, Mount St. Helens erupted. It was after the um, lake um, collapsed um, because it, it filled up with the water from the volcano, and then two years later, it collapsed, and it made this um, huge canyon. It made a, a canyon. So anyway, all that to say, this is what I want to tell you. I am not a scientist, but I know scientists. And I have amazing books by scientists. And what I want you to know is that very um, reputable, intelligent, well-known, well-researched scientists have written books about this. This one is called Footprints in the Sand. John Morris is a PhD, and Steve Austin is a PhD in geology. And they're the ones that research what Mount St. Helens tells us. And fascinating how so many things, petrified forests that they've always said took millions of years, they figured out how petrified forests were made from studying what happened at Mount St. Helens. It doesn't take millions of years. because it. But anyway, all these different things, um, and he tells you how the sedimentation happened very quickly. One of the interesting things he talks about is the dating. You know, they're, they're making us all believe that this iso, uh, radioisotope dating proves that things are millions and billions of years old, right? So they, they tried to date the lava that erupted from Mount St. Helens, and the lava, they, the rock they tested, 
tested to be either 300, between 350,000 and 2.4 million years old <laughs> that they know was created in 1980, between 1980 and 80, <laughs> 1986. So all that to say, there's many, many examples like that where they're telling us that these things, we can prove it now because we have this dating system. This dating system is obviously flawed. In our own John Baumgartner, we've been so privileged here that we have two um, very um, well-known um, creation scientists, Dr. Steve Austin, who was one of the authors of this book, and Dr. John Baumgartner. If you go online, if you've never done this, those of you who know John, go online and read his bio. It's very fascinating. He's got Global Flood, I think, globalflood.com, and it has his bio, how he came to faith, and then all the proofs, why he believes in creation even though he's a geophysicist. Um, and he, uh, uh, anyway, his name is Baumgartner, B-A-U-M-G-A-R-D-N-E-R, uh, I believe. Um, and then this is uh, another book that Steve Austin wrote, Grand Canyon and Monument to Catastrophe. They take people on tours now of the Grand Canyon on a regular basis because now they understand after Mount St. Helens that so much of what the Grand Canyon is showing us is showing us the catastrophe of the flood. And they will take you on this tour, and they will I was, show you. I was set up to go with Andrew Schnelling. Uh, yes, Andrew Schnelling. But yes. that's life change for me. So uh -huh. I mean, that it's Paul's to be been, and he says and it Schnelling. is amazing what they will show you on this tour. The proofs of the flood. And um, then I just wanted to read you really quickly um, this. Um, uh, this was another book Paul had. He just read one about DNA that he was just fascinated, but it was way too complicated for me. But it showed, again, that there's no way DNA just happened. But this is a guy who's a geneticist, uh, J.C. Sanford. He wrote Genetic Entropy, and um, he's a 30-year professor at Cornell University. And um, he has um, written over 100 scientific um, paper, uh, he's been published, uh, written over, over 100. He's made uh, significant scientific contributions. Um, he's come up with um, new ways of doing things He's uh, through his research. So anyway, he's very well uh, respected um, in his field. And I just wanted to read you, and the reason I'm doing this, I'm going to get off science here in a minute because, you know, it's, we're, we're here to study the Bible. But the reason why I feel like this is so important is because this is how they are causing our children and our young people to doubt their faith. Mm -hmm. They are talking about evolution as if it's a fact. Instead of treating it as a theory, and if they treated it as a scientific theory, you would quickly see that there's problems with it. So I want to read to you what happened. This is kind of his testimony. Um, and he's going to talk a lot about the primary axiom. And the primary axiom is that man is merely a product of random mutations plus natural selection. That's that macro evolution that we talked about last week. And he says that's the primary axiom. That's what everything is hinging on as they're teaching uh, our kids science these days. So let me read to you what he says. Late in my career, I did something that would seem unthinkable for a Cornell professor. I began to question the primary axiom. I did this with great fear and trepidation. I knew I would be at odds with the most sacred cow within modern academia. Among other things, it might even result in my expulsion from the academic world. Although I had achieved considerable success and notoriety within my own particular specialty, applied genetics, it would mean stepping out of the security of my own safe niche. I would have to begin exploring some very big things, including aspects of theoretical genetics, which I had always simply accepted by faith. I felt compelled to do all this, but I must confess that I fully expected to hit a brick wall. To my own amazement, I gradually realized that the seemingly great and unassailable fortress, which has been built up around the primary axiom, was really a house of the primary axiom is actually an extremely vulnerable theory. In fact, it's essentially indefensible. Its apparent invincibility derives largely from bluster, smoke, and mirrors. A large part of what keeps the axiom standing is an almost mystical faith which the true believers hold regarding the omnipotence of natural selection. As I went deeper, I began to see that this unshakable faith in natural selection is typically coupled with a degree of ideological commitment which can only be described as religious. 
I started to realize, again with trepidation, that I might be offending the religion of a great number of people. So what is the religion? The religion is this belief in macroevolution and in this primary axiom. And he's realizing, oh my goodness, if I start questioning this, I'm going to get in deep waters really fast. Um, to question the primary axiom of macroevolution required me to re-exam virtually everything I thought I knew about genetics. This was the most difficult intellectual endeavor of my life. Deeply entrenched thought patterns only change very slowly, and I must add painfully. What I eventually experienced was a complete overthrow of my previous understanding. Several years of personal struggle resulted in the new and very strong conviction that the primary axiom was definitely wrong. More importantly, I became convinced that the axiom could be shown to be wrong to any reasonable and open-minded individual. This realization was both exhilarating and frightening. I realized that I had an obligation to openly challenge this most sacred of cows. I also realized I could earn for myself the intense disdain of many of my colleagues within academia not to mention very intense opposition and anger from other high places. So what should I do? It has become my conviction that the primary axiom is insidious on the highest level, having a catastrophic impact on countless human lives. And as we talked about last week, I mean, from China to Russia to Nazi Germany, it was this belief in the primary axiom and that we're just here by random chance, random mutations. You know, that it's survival of the fittest that has led to millions of people dying and it's led to millions of people, it's led to our children not feeling like there's any meaning in life, right? Any ultimate purpose. It says, furthermore, every form of objective analysis I have performed has convinced me that the axiom is clearly false. So now, regardless of the consequences, I have to say it out loud. The emperor has no clothes. <laughs> So I just want you to know, this is a geneticist, very respected geneticist. Another one is Michael Behe, who has written several books, and he's a biochemist, and he has come up with theories that people are having a hard time disputing of irreducible complexity. He wrote uh, Darwin's Black Box. And so all I want to say is, maybe you're not scientifically inclined. I am not naturally scientifically inclined, but I have been interested in this because I see what it's doing to our young people. And so I want our young people to know, I want you to help our young people know that there are answers, right? Don't accept what they're telling you as fact. It's not a good theory. Evolution, macroevolution is not a good theory. It doesn't hold up when you start questioning it, when you start looking at things and just saying, does it match what we see? Um, so anyway, I want you to um, know that and be informed. Don't trust me, I'm not a scientist, but read up. If this is something you've had questions about, something, and Becky, I was delighted. Becky, share, tell them what happened with you and how that Well, for me, well, we were talking about, you know, Candace said last week that, you know, it, it, when Mount St. Helens happened, why didn't the whole world go, yeah. oh, now I yeah. see it. And I, and I told Candace, I, that was me, I did see it because I was one of those kids that grew up learning that, you know, billions and billions of years, and I could not reconcile that with the creation that I knew was true in my heart. And so rather than trying to, you know, I kept trying to fit it yeah. together, it didn't fit, so I just walked away. And, um, you know, along with other things that went on in my life, but, but when Mount St. Helens happened and all of the stuff, and one of the things was those trees, those yeah, vertical those trees. Vertical that was trees one of the things the that, because yeah. I had studied geology. Yeah. And, um, and so that was one of the things that I went, oh, you know, yeah. uh, there were so many things about it that confirmed that there was a giant catastrophe and it could happen in a, in a moment in time and not over billions of years that for me it was life changing and it was the part, one of the many things that turned me back towards the Lord That's was good. realizing that Mount St. Helens was God's way of saying, look, here's how it happened, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And like I said last week, God is not asking us to check our brains at the door. He's yeah. saying, use your brains, look at these things, um, discover for yourself. And um, one of the things that I want us to do is to pray for these men who are, who are doing this because they know, you hear, hear it in his testimony, they know that as soon as they come out as a creationist, you know, or even as somebody who's trying to say that there had to be a designer, right? 
that it, it's going to put them in the crosshairs. Mm -hmm. um, Michael Behe, who has done amazing research that is causing a lot of people to come to faith because of his research, I looked him up and they want to call him a pseudoscientist, mm -hmm. right? Because he's refuting um, what they're, they're trying to teach everybody about evolution. So I have a favorite quote I just wanted to share with you because I think it's not only for these scientists, but I think for us too in this day that we're living in this. So kind of crazy, right? And uh, it's, it's a quote by Kaim Podoc. And he says, did you know that Giordano Bruno was burned alive in Rome in 1600 for writing that the stars were suns? They cheated Bruno. They killed him for the truth. But he didn't cheat. You have to get killed sometimes, but you can't cheat. <clears throat> the cheating never hurts the stars, but your eyes get clouded. And I just think that here are these men that are standing up for something that they know is true, but they know they're going to get. They know they're going to get ridiculed and criticized and maybe expelled from the classroom. So we need to pray for these ones that are going before us. The other thing that dawned on me, and I remembered another creationist, I had, I had heard uh, this quote, and this is from Joseph Goebbels, um, who was the propaganda minister for Hitler. <coughs> and you might have heard this quote before. Because you think, well, how have they convinced so many people to believe this if they're really, the facts all line up against it, right? And this is what Joseph Goebbels says. He says, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of this made me sobered for what we're seeing going on in our political landscape. It says, the lie can be maintained only for such a time as the state can shield the people from the political, economic, and or military consequences of the lie. Mm -hmm. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its power to repress dissent. For the truth is the mortal enemy of the and thus, by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. I know, think on that for a little while. Okay, we're not going to get political. We're just going to go on. But I just want to say, we have to be people of the truth. And that means we stand for truth even when the truth isn't popular. Even when the truth is being ridiculed. And more and more, though we were born into a country that was standing on its Christian roots, we are more and more living in a country that is going farther and farther from its Christian roots. And so we need to be ones that say, you know, you have to get killed sometimes, but you can't cheat, right? You can't deny the truth and start believing the lies. So anyway, um, let's hop in. We're going to go back in um, Genesis 9. I wanted to pick up something that I didn't cover last week. In Genesis 9, um, we have the Noahic Covenant and just a couple things I didn't mention last time. And that is something happens after the flood that is different, that we didn't talk about. Somebody um, who has it open, uh, read for us Genesis 9, verses 1 through 3. And God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky. So what is changing here? Meat. We can eat meat, right? This was God giving us permission now, and it might be just because so much of the vegetation was destroyed, right? Um, and so now they can eat meat, and now there's a different relationship between us and the animals. Don't just, doesn't make you wonder what it was like in the garden? Mm -hmm. I think we get glimpses when he starts talking about the millennial kingdom, right? Yeah. Because he says the lion will be able to lay down with the lamb, right? Yeah. That, so, so they're... When God originally created, our relationship with animals were different, right? And even now you can see, even in our fallen state, you can see really special relationships between people and animals. But you think, what was it like before the fall, before sin entered our world? Um, so anyway, those are interesting things. The other thing I wanted to point out is in verse 16 when he's talking about the rainbow. I just want to see what he calls this covenant. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So he calls this covenant the 
everlasting covenant. The reason I want you to see that is when we get to Isaiah, Isaiah is the first one that is going to start talking to us about the fact that there is a real uh, severe judgment and time of terrible tribulation that's coming to the earth. And he says it's because we have broken the everlasting covenant. How did we break the everlasting covenant? What's the one thing in the covenant that he holds us responsible for? We talked about it last week. Go back to verses um, 5 and 6. Well, yeah. And for your lifeblood, he says, I will de surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each man too. I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. And you think about all the innocent people that have been killed, right? Um, because of man's <coughs> sin. And uh, so anyway, I just wanted you to see that because when we get to Isaiah, he'll refer back to this everlasting covenant. And I wanted you to see that. I would ask a question. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It says that I will demand an accounting of every animal. Yes. Now, animals don't have souls, do they? Not that we know of. Not that we know of. So how are they going to have an accounting of this? I, I don't know. I don't know. It's and a good question, Kelly. And is it, um, you know, you think about the rightful yeah. use of animals for food and mm -hmm. for, but then there's people that abuse and people that are just, you know, they, they start preying on animals and they start preying on humans. There's that, that mm -hmm. mindset that mm -hmm. keeps going that we weren't mm -hmm. even account, held accountable for that. No, he, that's he's that's not saying that here. He's just saying when an animal takes human life. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. That's in four through six. I will demand an accounting from every animal, but he's saying it because a man is made in the image of God. He's giving them permission to kill animals and eat them, right? So he's not saying, I'm going to hold you accountable for that. <laughs> if he was, we were all in trouble. No, he's saying, listen. Man is a special creation. He is created in my image, and I will hold to account men. But I think it's a good question. How does he hold animals to account? Because occasionally there are animals that will kill a human being. Mm -hmm. and in one of the notes, it says even in the law in Sinai, if a domestic animal killed, killed. a man, they, they were, were stoned the animal. And when you think about that, so, we kind of do that too, right? right? If, a, yeah, if an right. animal is out of control and attacking human beings, mm -hmm. then we put, put it down. down. So maybe, yeah, maybe that's part of it. Um, the other thing I wanted you to see, and we're not gonna, I'm not gonna make you just read all of the genealogies together as a group. Wouldn't that be fun? Um, but, in, <laughs> but in chapter 10, I want to point out an interesting thing. This is my last little science thing I'm gonna say today. Um, but in chapter 10, verse 25, after he's listed all these different people, he says two sons were born to Eber. One was named Peleg because in his time the earth was divided. Now what does that mean, in his time the earth was divided? Well, there's this interesting theory, um, and I mentioned it last week, but um, the first guy who pr proposed this was kind of scoffed at, but the more they have looked into this, the more that they will tell you that they think, that they believe now that this is the way it was. They believe that our earth used to be all one mass they call it pangea and you can see how it just would fit together if you just move this over it fits together like a puzzle mm -hmm. and now we know that the continents are drifting apart right mm -hmm. we know that mm -hmm. um, so and think about it all right because if after the flood all mankind was together in one spot how did people get to different continents when columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492 <laughs> Why did he find people on the other side of the ocean? How did those people get there? Mm -hmm. But if the world was all together one, and then Dr. Bon John Baumgartner has done a lot of study on the tectonic plates and what would have happened during the flood with all this volcanic activity going on. Um, anyway, now they're, they're fairly certain that that's what happened, is that the world was one continent, one landmass, and then after the flood, it began, and we think Peleg was named Peleg. We don't know this for sure, but because it started happening in his time, and it was such a, I mean, wouldn't you be going, oh my goodness, 
<laughs> you know, the land masses are moving apart from one another. And so that was such a striking thing that it seems like they might have named their son after that. Divided. divided. And he says, his, yeah, his name means divided, but then he goes on to explain he was named divided because it was in his time that the earth was divided. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, and of course we don't, you know, can't say that for sure. It might be just the division that happened because of the Tower of Babel. Um, but again, you have to think, how did we get to all these different places in the world? So anyway, I think that's interesting. So now we're going to go on and we're going to, oh, this is very cool what we're going to learn today. It's very important what we're going to learn today. It's important because it still has an impact today. This still has an impact. So we're going to meet a man named Abram. Who knows what Abram means? Exalted father. So Abram means exalted father. And now think about it. So now, after the Tower of Babel, now everybody's splitting up. Now you have all these people groups going to different places on the earth, right? Finding homes in different places on the earth. Well, what do we remember from Genesis 3.15? What did God promise he was going to do? He was going to send somebody, born of a woman, who was going to crush the head of Satan, right? But now there's a problem. Now we're all split up, right? We're all in these different people groups. So which people group is this going to come through? Who's, who's this person going to come through that's going to be born of a woman that's going to rescue us out of this trap that we've fallen into through Satan? So we're going to find out in chapter 12. Somebody read chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, so this is what we call the Abrahamic covenant, and this is the first time it's articulated. And what, what are the things that he's promising Abram? First he's saying, listen, I want you to move. I have a plan, and I want you to move. And he, by faith, says, okay, I'll do it, right? But what does he say he'll do if he, will, if he will leave his country and his father's house and believe God? What will he do? A great nation. He'll become a great nation. You'll bless him. He'll be blessed. Everyone will be blessed through that nation. Everybody will be. All the people on the earth are going to be blessed through him. How is that going to happen, gals? Jesus. 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 Thank you. We can look at this in hindsight and go, oh. That's what he's talking about, Jesus. And then in verse 3, interesting, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. Now, this is very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Do you know that a lot of our U.S. policy up to this point, and I really believe it's changing, has been based on this verse? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you realize that the reason the U.S. has supported Israel the way that it has in the past is because they believe this Abrahamic covenant? That those who bless Israel will be blessed by God. Those who curse Israel will be cursed by God. Mm -hmm. uh, President Obama was the first one who turned away from that um, and was very negative towards Israel. And then we switched back to President Trump, right? Which for the first time recognized which presidents for uh, decades had promised that they would make Jerusalem uh, the place where we put our embassy. And he finally did it. But a lot of our policy with Israel has be been based on this verse. I have a fascinating book, if you're interested on this. It's called Eye to Eye. And a guy has tracked what has happened to us as a nation every time we've turned against Israel. And it's quite, it's quite a fascinating thing. And uh, it, it records somebody, uh, one of the congressmen, standing up and speaking out for Israel. And he's speaking out for Israel on the base of the Bible, on the basis of the Bible. So anyway, it's a very interesting read. Um, I don't know if I completely agree with it, but it's an interesting, very fascinating read. So anyway, so um, Abram left. He, he, he left. He was 75 years old. I want you to note that in verse 4. So Abram's 75 when God appears to him and, and makes this promise to him. And then he doesn't just promise this blessing, and we call it the seed when he says, I'll make you into a great nation, lots of descendants. There's three parts to the blessing. And every time I see it, I record which part of the blessing it is. He's going to reiterate it ten times in Genesis. So the seed is the first part of the blessing. You're going to have lots of descendants. How many descendants does Abraham have at Abram have at 75? 
None. None. Zero. Yeah. Okay? So this is a faith thing, right? And then the blessing is the blessing and cursing of those who will bless them and, or those who will curse them, and that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. And then the third thing we're going to see in verse 7, um, he takes them to the land of Canaan, and then he appears to Abram again and says, to your offspring I will give this land. So the land is the third part of the Abrahamic covenant. So now... Very important, and it's in your covenant study here. It's on page 16. The Abraham, uh, Abrahamic covenant is a very important covenant. Um, it's reiterated. You can see all the passages in there where um, he talks about the Abrahamic covenant. But I want um, you to notice what kind of a covenant it is. What kind of a covenant is it? Is he saying, Abraham, it's, you unconditional. Do, it's unconditional. He's saying, Abram, I'm going to do this for you. It's not conditional. He doesn't place a bunch of conditions and say, if you do this, I will do that. Um, so it's an unconditional covenant. We're going to see it's also an everlasting covenant. We'll see that as we keep going. So anyway, so Abram, in great faith, sets out from his home of Ur, which I wanted to show you on the map. Ur is over here, like, just uh, under where the Garden of Eden was, right? It's just on the other side of the um, Euphrates River. And so he's over here in Ur, and then God tells him to go way over here to Canaan, to Shechem in Canaan. And in uh, the daily walk, it says it's about 1,400 miles. And there was no cars, right? There's no, so, I mean, by faith, he was going a great distance from his, um, his home. But he didn't uh, do that all at once. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then there's a famine. He's in Shechem where God tells him, okay, I'm going to give you all this land of Canaan. And then there's a famine, and he goes down to Egypt. But what happens when he's in Egypt, this great man of faith? What happens? <laughs> <laughs> he's afraid because his wife is very beautiful and he's going to Egypt where they're more powerful than he is right and so he's afraid and out because of his lack of faith he says okay Sarah you're going to tell him you're my sister which technically she was she was his half sister but you know um, anyway so Pharaoh takes her, her into his harem and until things start going awry, he doesn't, they get afflicted by disease, and that's how Pharaoh realizes, and he's like, what? Why didn't you tell me? So Abram, we see, what I love about the Bible is it shows us these people of faith who believed God, but they all have feet of clay, all of them, right? It's not like, um, anyway, it's not like legends you read about or myths, right, where they try and make these people sound superhuman. They, they are amazing because they took steps of faith, but we see in the Bible they all had faults. They all had things that they struggled with. What were you saying? It's kind of like it's easy to trust God with big things, uh -huh. but sometimes, but sometimes yes. <laughs> Isn't that true? Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's interesting in this, just the timeline. So she's there for, it's got to be quite a while because um, he's acquiring sheep and cattle and donkeys and servants and diseases happen. And it's like all this time he's getting more stuff. I just got to wonder what he was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> got to wonder. Yeah. Got to wonder. Yeah. It, 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 yes. It was a, a pretty big failing on Abram's part. And it's not the only time. No, right? No. Just so he's, he's, you would think he would learn, right? Yes. Um, so anyway, after the famine, he returns back uh, to Canaan. And then he's got a problem when he comes back to Canaan in chapter 13 because now he and Lot are so fabulously wealthy that there's not enough land for all their flocks. So they have to split up. Abram gives them the choice, and Lot picks the better land. The better land. But the problem with this better land is what? Sodom. It's right next to Sodom and Gomorrah, which was known to be an evil city, and we're going to see how evil it is, right? So at the same, but um, Abram, God appears to Abram after that decision is made, and somebody read again what God tells Abram in uh, verses 14 through 16. Chapter 13, 14 through 16. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are, to the north and the south, to the east and the west, and all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. For how long? Forever. forever. Okay, keep going. 16. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Wow, and how many children does Abraham have at this point? 
Zero. Zero. So what two parts of the blessing or the covenant is he reiterating here? The seed and the land, right? He's reiterating that for the second time. So now a fascinating thing happens in chapter 14. Some kings from over here by where um, Abram came from are going to attack the kings over here. And um, they attack and they capture a lot. Um, and they take him captive along with the people from Sodom and Gomorrah. And who comes to the rescue? Abraham. Abraham. And this is where we start getting, I mean, he told us he was wealthy. But now we start getting a hint of how wealthy he is. Because Abraham, somebody read what he had in verse 14 of chapter 14. Now, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went to and went in pursuit of Sodom and Gomorrah. All right, so how many trained fighting men did Abraham have? Abraham had? He had 318, and those had wives and children, and then somebody said last night, what about all the untrained men? Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, he probably had five, six, people that he was taking care of yeah. that's a lot of people yeah. you have to be pretty wealthy to be able to care for that many people but anyway Abram and these 318 men went came to the rescue they brought back Lot and all the possessions of the people of Sodom and then we have this very interesting passage which one day in heaven we'll be able to understand <laughs> completely but um, anyway Abram comes back and then in verse 18 somebody read what happens 18 through 20 Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. He blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So who is this Melchizedek? very mysterious person, right, that we meet. Um, nothing more is explained about Melchizedek. He's referred to two other times in the Bible. We're going to see him again in Psalms when he's talking about it's a messianic psalm, and we're going to see him in Hebrews when the author of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is a high priest like Melchizedek, not like the Levitical priests who were born and died, and, but not like Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek means king of righteousness, he is the king of Salem, which means peace. So there's some, you know, speculation of maybe this was Jesus himself, but we don't know. Just this Melchizedek appears out of nowhere, and um, and he talks about God Most High, right? Blessed be Abram by God Most High, Creator of heavens and earth, of the heavens and the earth, and blessed be God Most High who delivered your enemies into your hand. And so Melchizedek gives all praise to God Most High. And then Abram respects Melchizedek so much that he gives him a tenth of everything. And that's the first, first tithe we ever see in the Bible. So anyway, Melchizedek's a bit of a mystery, but he's an interesting mystery that one day in heaven we'll be able to figure out. So the king of Salem, what is Salem? Well, there again, there's some Jerusalem. speculation it was Jerusalem. Yeah, that this is the first mention of Jerusalem. It doesn't say Jerusalem, but Salem is it's the city of peace, Jerusalem. Yeah, so they think he might be the king of Jerusalem. Yeah. So anyway, it's just kind of a fascinating person, and you'll meet many fascinating people as we go through the scriptures, but Melchizedek is one of them. Um, so anyway, um, and Abram won't take any, like they offer him bounty from his recovery, and they're like, he's like, no, I'm not going to accept anything. I don't want anybody else to say that they've made Abram rich, you know. So then in chapter 15, very interesting passage. So we get to 15, and uh, the Lord appears to Abram in a vision and says, Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. But Abram said, Oh, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. You've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. So he's like, Okay, Lord. So now several years have passed since he made the promise to him that he was going to have so many descendants. And he's still childless. He's probably now in his early 80s. Sarah's in her early 70s, right? And he's like, I still don't have an heir, and all my, everything I have is going to go to Eliezer, right? 
So um, the Lord says to him, this man, Eliezer, will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside. He said, look at the heavens and count the stars. If indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So what's he reiterating about the covenant? The seed. Uh, Abraham believed the Lord, it says. Okay, so he has no kids, even after all these years. And he believes the Lord, and the Lord credits that to him as righteousness. Um, he also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram says, oh, sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? Right? It looks so unlikely, right? Even though he's a rich man and whatever, there's all these people groups that are living in Canaan. And he's like, you know, how, how is this ever going to happen? So he asks him to do a very strange thing, strange to us. He says, I want you to go out and get these animals. I want you to get a heifer, a goat, a ram, each three years old, along with a dove, in verse 9. Abram brought all these things to him, and he says, cut them in two and arrange the halves on opposite sides. And you're going, what? <laughs> right? I didn't understand this until my Paul was giving a sermon, and he had researched this out. And this is how they made covenants in ancient times. So what they would do is they would take the animals and they would cut them in half and then the two kings would walk together through these animals that had been cut in half and they would say, so shall it be done to me <laughs> if I break this covenant with you. So it was a very serious covenant. You were saying, I, I am staking my life, right? You can cut me in two if I break this covenant is what they're saying as they walk through this. What's fascinating about this is Abram doesn't walk through. Only God. So look at what happens. Well, and before we see that, look what happens in an amazing prophecy, starting in verse 12. As the sun setting, Abram falls into a deep sleep, and a thick, dreadful darkness comes over him. And then the Lord says to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. What is he prophesying? He's, he's prophesying, yes, there's slavery in Egypt. This is at least 100, if not 150 years before that's going to happen. But he's telling him, he says, now I know, Abram, you don't have any kids yet, but I'm telling you, when you do have kids, this is what's going to happen to them, right? <laughs> yeah. They're going to be a slave for 400 years. But then look what he goes on to say. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. Who's he going to punish? Egypt. How does he punish Egypt? <laughs> the plagues, 10 plagues that absolutely devastate Egypt. We're going to read that in a little bit. Um, and afterwards, they will come out with great possessions. What, what happens when they finally, after the 10 plagues? Egyptians. The Egyptians are like, here, take my gold, take my silver, take my cows, take whatever, right? Just leave, right? So God is giving Abram this whole outline of what's going to happen, and that's not going to happen for 500 more years at least, right? He's telling him something that's going to happen 500 years in the future. Um, but then he says, you, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation... Your descendants will come back here. Now, this is fascinating. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. This is really fascinating. Because when um, they finally get back to the land of Canaan, who is in the land? The Canaanites. The Canaanites and part of the Canaanites are these Amorites. And what God is explaining here is that I am going to use you to punish the people in this land because their wickedness. We're going to read about how wicked they were. They were offering their children in the fire um, to their gods. They were burning their children. They were um, uh, almost all of their uh, worship practice had sexual immorality involved with it. Um, anyway, they were just they. Had, but He says, "Listen, I'm not going to send you in there." until their wickedness has reached its fullness. So God is a just God. He couldn't send Abram in to take possession of the land yet, land yet because they were not yet, had not reached that level of wickedness that God was going to send them in as a judgment and a punishment against the people. So isn't that interesting? I find that interesting. Um, so um, anyway,
anyway, he gives them this prophecy, and then when the sun sets in verse 17, and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. So this was God passing through the pieces. Abram didn't, only God. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. Um, so he reiterates the land part of the covenant. So anyway, it's just a very interesting thing. Understanding how they made covenants back in that day was really helpful to me because you read this passage and you're like, what's up with this, right? So I have a question. Yeah. So it says from the river of Egypt, mm -hmm. which is the Nile, mm -hmm. right? As far as the great river, the yeah. river Euphrates. Yeah. That's not what we think of as the nation of Israel, is right. it? It's a lot more. <laughs> yeah, it's more. And so you have to know, and we're going to see that as we go on, the Israelites have never taken full possession of the land that God promised them. They will, but they have not yet taken full possession of the land that was promised to them by the Lord. Um, good point. Um, so in 16, now, okay, so now there's been years gone by, about 10 years uh, since this promise in, when he was 75. And um, Sarah is getting doubtful about, you know, how, how this is going to happen because, you know, now she's in her um, 70s, you know, 76. And so, anyway, um, she comes up with a plan. What's her big plan? What's her great plan? I, it, yes. And apparently this also was a custom when you were childless is that you could, you know, let your handmaiden, you know, have kids for you. So that would be how you would have kids. So, how does that work out? Oh, <laughs> not great, right? Because as soon as this, as soon as actually she gets pregnant, you know, then um, it changes Hagar's attitude towards Sarah. Sarah's upset about this whole thing. Sarah starts mistreating Hagar, so Hagar uh, flees. Um, but I, I think this is fascinating about our Lord, is that um, we see that he cares about individuals, right? Mm -hmm. So here's Hagar, who's nothing really in the plan, not part of this big plan that God has for Abram. Um, and yet he sees Hagar, who is um, in trouble, right, running away from her mistress with no place to go. And he appears to her in nine. The angel of the Lord has appeared to her actually in seven, found Hagar, appears to her. And the angel says, go back to your mistress and submit to her. In verse 10, the angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. Well, who are Hagar and Abram's descendants? The Muslims. The Arabs. The Arabs are Hagar and Abram's descendants. So the longest running conflict that we know in ever in history is this conflict between the Arabs and the Israelis. And it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 16, right? When a woman took, a woman took right? So all this, so, and so here's this fascinating, yes. So here's this fascinating thing, is that we're seeing this play out in our time. Is that crazy? That we're watching this and that we can trace it all the way back here to Genesis 16. So anyway, she says, I'm going to increase your descendants. I've heard your cry, I've heard your misery. And then he describes him. Somebody read verse 12. His name will be Ishmael, and what will he, will he be like? He will be, a wild, he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, Hagar is relieved because she didn't know what she was going to do. And I love what she says. Somebody read verse 13. I just think it's so beautiful. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. So here this Gentile young woman understands that there is a God who is, sees her. Mm -hmm. The God who sees me. And it's marvelous to know that that same God who say, saw Hagar sees us. Mm -hmm. He knows all about your situation. He knows all about you. He knows all about the struggles that you're facing. We serve the God who sees us. Um, so anyway, how old was Abram at the end of that chapter when he, when Hagar had Ishmael? He's so he's 86. So he's been promised at 75, has, has Ishmael at 86. And then in 17, when Abram is 99 years old, 24 years after this promise is made, the Lord appears to him and says, I am God.
God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Right, right now his numbers is how many? One. <laughs> and it's not the one that was supposed to be, right? So Abram fell face down and God says to him, um, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be a father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, which means exalted father. I'm sorry, yeah, it's chapter 17. Uh, verse 5, no longer will you be called Abram, which means exalted father. Now your name will be Abraham, father of many, for I have made you a father of nations. I just, you think, how much faith did this take, right? To believe that this man who's had so much trouble having kids is going to be a father of nations. And then in, in 6, he says, I will make you very fruitful. These are important verses, gals. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant. It's unconditional. It's everlasting between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. To be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you are now an alien, I will give you as an everlasting possession, everlasting possession <laughs> to you and your descendants after you and I will be their God. Um, and then he asks one thing of him as a token, as a sign of this covenant. What does he ask of him? And all the males. <laughs> circumcision. Circumcision, which I have a big question about this, right? Why circumcision? Um, and we know, I mean, there have been studies done. Um, they, they think it's healthier to, mm -hmm. to be circumcised. The fact that he had them do it on the eighth day for a newborn, they found that the clotting is just right on the eighth day. So God made us. He knows these things, right? Um, but I often wonder why that is a sign. And this thought has occurred to me. I have no idea. I'm just passing out a happy theory here. But because um, Satan knows what God has said, right? Remember how he tried to, he's always trying to foil God's plan. He can't, but he is always and forever trying. So you remember how he tried to foil God's plan in Genesis 6 by sending, you know, demonic angels to intermarry and try and destroy the race that way because he knew it was going to come from the woman. But now what does he know? He knows that the promised one who's going to bless all the nations is going to come through who? Abraham. Abram. Abram. And so I don't know of any other explanation for what has happened to the Jewish people. Have you ever seen any other people group that has been so persecuted? Ever, right? I mean, we think of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust there, but anti-Semitism goes way back before that, right? And, and continued after it, and we're seeing anti-Semitism rise today. Why? I mean, Jews are doctors and lawyers. There are more Jews that have Nobel Peace Prizes. You know, there's just, why, why are we so against this people group, right? It's satanic. And I think it's satanic. And so, I, so to me, I wonder, did God give him this sign and make it a private sign so that when the persecution broke out, there's no, like if he'd said, put it on your forehead so everybody knows you're a Jew, right? When persecution breaks out, there, anyway, I just, it's just a thought, an idea, but it is the one way that God said this will be a sign. Okay, all right. Sorry for the interruption. We have a, a phone call. That came. <laughs> all right. So back in 17, chapter 17, verse 23, it says, "On that very day, Abram took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household, and he had them all circumcised." And he was 99. Yeah. That was bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, then um, the Lord comes to Abram, three men, um, but we know one of them was uh, probably Jesus. We think it's a theophany um, because he talks about being the Lord in the midst of it. So anyway, he comes and appears to Abram, and Abram invites him in and, you know, kills the fatty calf and whatnot. And then in verse uh, 10 of chapter 18, then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Well, now, <laughs> they're about 10 years apart if Abram's, if Abraham, father of many, is now 99. How old is Sarah? 89. 89. She's old. So, um, my age. Sarah, yeah, there you go. There you go. May, would you like to have a baby at this point in your life? So, Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years. So, 
Sarah was past the age of childbearing by ways. So Sarah laughed as she, she says, how is this going to happen? I'm worn out. My master is old. So then the Lord says to Abram, why did Sarah laugh? Now this is really cute, you guys, because Sarah laughs. Abram laughs at some point. What is the name of their son? Isaac, Isaac which means laughter. laughter. I just think it's cute, right? Yeah. So Sarah laughed. The Lord says, um, why did Sarah laugh and say, well, I have a child now that I'm old? And then I love verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard? No. So Sarah was afraid and says, well, I didn't laugh. <laughs> she did. Um, but I like it when God says no. Yeah, no, you, did. you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know those things, right? So anyway, um, Abraham, um, then God says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And he goes ahead and tells Abraham, he says, listen, because of, and it's interesting how he says it um, in verse 20. Uh, somebody read verse 20 and 21. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very great, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. So he's saying, listen, I am hearing terrible things about Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And he says, if it's true, I'm going to destroy them. The wages of sin is death. death. And so um, Abraham pleads with them because he's got Lot there, right? So he pleads with them, listen, Lord, if there's 50, will you, will you not destroy him if there's 50? And yes, I won't destroy him if there's 50. He gets all the way down and keeps bargaining. He gets all the way down to 10. And he said, if there's 10 righteous, will you not destroy him? He says, yes, if there's 10, I will not destroy him. Kathy, yeah. who do you think the outcry is from? That's, it's interesting. I think there were people who were suffering, right, because of their wickedness. Obviously, we're going to see um, people were suffering. So, yeah. And why does God say if? Yes, that's, that's an interesting thing because obviously God knows. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in verse 20, in verse 20 uh, 21, um, uh, and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. Don't you think, though, that that's inviting this conversation with Abraham, though? Yeah. Because otherwise, he could have just gone, oh, bye-bye, I'm going to go destroy a city. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and then this conversation wouldn't have come up. Yeah. So I think he was inviting the conversation with Abraham and and to show us. Mm -hmm. I'm just, just ten people, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, God was willing to be gracious. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I don't know the answer to that, too, yeah. ultimately. I don't know the answer. Um, but if there's sin, there's always a victim. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's true. And we're going to see, cutting into 19, 19 is one of the saddest chapters in Genesis. Um, Isn't this outcry a cry of righteous indignation, the blood of Abel? For then, the, he came one of the reasons for the destruction of the city. Hmm. I was just wondering if perhaps there were angels that were coming back and, and saying, reporting. Yeah, yeah reporting. And, saying, and it could be. Yeah. yeah, it could absolutely it could be. Mm. So anyway, two angels arrive in Sodom, and uh, you know they're in the in the town square, and Lot is like, "No, you need to come home with me." I think Lot knows right <laughs> what's going to happen if they stay in the square. So he insists, and um, what happens in verse four? Okay. Somebody read it. Four and five. Well, okay, I'm just hold on. Yes. Do you okay. think? Do you think? <laughs> yeah. Do you think that he knew? Like, it appears to me that he knew that they were angels, that they were not just men. Yeah. Because he fought so hard to keep them and even offering his daughters, which I know is the hospitality of the day, but do you think he knew they were angels? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know how I to say that. <laughs> not my hospitality, but <laughs> you need to be the culture. <laughs> so, so it's interesting. <laughs> Because they're identified as angels. So obviously he came to realize they were angels, whether he realized it right away yeah. or not. The men of the city aren't looking at them as angels. The men of the city are seeing them as, ooh, good looking Or maybe them, so. they did see them, and that's what they, I don't know. I think maybe he didn't know they were angels until they next came back. And it saw could, and it could but, be. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, and those for sure. Yeah, and, and they find out that, you know, these angels are going to tell them, hey, we're going to, the city is going to be destroyed. So he pretty, then he, 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 then he knows, knows, you yeah. know, these are messengers yeah. from God. But anyway, um, going on to verse four, before they had gone to bed, all the men 
not, not just a few. All the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called out to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. And Lot is so distressed, but what he says is, like, way distressing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and you wonder, how long had Lot lived in Sodom and Gomorrah that he would think that sending his virgin daughters out would be to these oh. men who are ready to rape whoever he sends out? Well, you know, weren't the daughters married? So how could they... They aren't married. They are betrothed. Oh, okay. They are betrothed. He had other married. daughters. And their husbands must have been like these men. I, yeah. 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 So, yeah. 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 I don't know. Point me. And they did not come. Yeah. You gotta wonder if they didn't get like enough. Oh, oh I know. Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, all men? Yeah. yeah. And I've always been, all my life, just totally disgusted with lots of offers of opportunity. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. I mean, I just, that always hurt me. Yeah. 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 I think all yeah, of us, remember, right? You're like, you know, as a junior high kid yeah. uh -huh. in Sunday yeah. school, yeah. 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 the junior high group, you yeah. know. But I, I just think what we're seeing is that Lot himself has been compromised. I think right. we get another clue when he goes to try and tell his son-in-laws, listen, you have to come out or the, the city's going to be destroyed. And they think he's joking. And I'm like, why would they think he's joking? Yeah. What was it about Lot and what their relationship, what he right. had been like, that would make them think he's mm. joking rather than sincerely saying, we right. need to get out of here? I don't know. So much yeah. profound yeah. sadness in yeah. this passage. Yeah, yeah. very, very. Do you think very God was disgusted? How could he no, not be? Yeah, I would imagine. I mean, I don't know. If we yeah. are. Is this flavor like it's all okay? No. Uh -uh. Oh. Uh -uh. No. Just, not not okay at all. You know, but, you know, but again, that's an interesting thought that did he know these were angels and that made him extra incentive yeah. to try and rescue the angels. But of course, you don't have to rescue angels. Angels can rescue themselves. Right. But if you're lost and don't know, then yes. you wouldn't know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think, I think what happened a lot is what we see in our, our culture, right? Is that he's just kind of adapting to the culture yeah. that he's around, right? Yeah. And I think it affects. But I think it affects. You can always have this second. Like they're almost supposed to be an animal. Like they're, you know, they're part of what they own. Yes. And and I think that was true until... I mean, I know it's the yeah. culture of, yeah. of the time. Yeah. The time. Yeah. Yeah, but it's yeah. very sad. It's yeah. very, you know, like you say, you can't read this passage without being sad. So now this yeah. struck me for the first time. I've read this so many times, and I this hit me in a different way. Yeah. In verse 9, chapter 19, verse 9. Uh, when he offers his daughters, don't do anything to these men, the men say, get out of our way, they replied. And they said, this fellow came here as an alien, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat, uh, we'll treat you worse than them. And this is what hit me. So we're living in a day and age where everybody's saying, don't judge, right? Mm -hmm. Don't judge. It's wrong to judge. So we have been on this slippery slope for a long time where we have gotten so far from God's design. One man, one woman become one flesh for one lifetime. It was a beautiful design, right? Mm -hmm. And then it began to be, well, I want to have sex before I get married. Don't judge me, right? I, I want to have an affair and not have any fault for it. Don't judge me, you know? Um, men wanting to have sex with men, don't judge me. Women wanting to have sex with women, don't judge me. Men wanting to be women, don't judge me. Men, women wanting to be men, don't judge me. Don't judge me, don't judge me, don't judge me. And how far can that don't judge me go? All the way to a band of men knocking on a door saying, go get those men to us so that we can gang rape them and don't judge me. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Don't judge me. Right? What right do you have to judge me? And that's the fallacy of this argument that we're watching how it's taking our whole culture and sinking it into this moral morass, right? Mm -hmm. But it's this whole tolerance, don't judge me, right? You have no right to judge me. And to think that men who are ready to gang rape whoever he throws out the door can say, what right do you have to judge me? As if that's not a terrible, awful thing that they're asking to do. Anyway, that struck me in a way it's never struck me before. Which is, that's sobering for us too, right? Because we're like, 
we're kind of like these scientists. If we stand up and say, no, that's wrong, we are the ones that get attacked, attacked right? right? And I think he just went along. And I think, isn't that something that we understand because it's tempting for us to just go along because we know if we stand up for the truth, you know, what's going to happen. And he was there because yeah. of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, really good point, Annabelle. Really good point. Chose his friends wrong. I think this man looks different yeah. than the man who ran the show. Yeah. And that made him know that they were not yeah. the same. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, I, I yeah. question the ability for discernment during this time, this particular part of this time. Mm -hmm. Because in talking about the angels, they had potential. Yes, right. Them. Yeah. I don't necessarily know that the people during this time had the discernment mm -hmm. to be able to understand God. So, what they didn't have, so uh, this is called dispensations, right? What they didn't have, the Holy Spirit. they didn't have the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and they didn't have the law. Um, the law doesn't come till later, but they did have one important thing. What did they have? A conscience. They had a conscience mm -hmm. because that was a blessing that God instilled in every human being. And they had the oral story. And they, they had the oral story. If you think about it, um, Adam, remember we looked at it, Adam was alive, right? Until, you know, people that were dying in the flood, right? So they had an understanding, and then Noah would have passed that understanding on to his descendants. So it really comes back to the failing of these people to pass on the truth. There has to be a standard of judgment because they brought it to their church. Yes. There has to be a standard of right. 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 That is a good point. Say that again, Lori. There has to be a standard somewhere because how can you judge me? What's the standard? So somewhere in their culture, they have a standard. Mm -hmm. Well, so and otherwise I think they wouldn't have known that word. And I think yeah. Romans, yeah, I think Romans 2 gives us some insight when he's, he talks about how, um, indeed, in uh, Romans 2, 14, it says, Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law. So, yes, there were some that were like Sodom and Gomorrah that were going off the rails in wickedness. But there are Gentiles, and you find them all over the world, who are trying to live according to what they feel is right in their conscience. He, he says, so when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves. Even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their consciences are bearing witness and their thoughts now accusing them and now even defending them. And we all know this, right? Have you ever done anything and you have a thought that's accusing you that thing that I just did was wrong? Yeah. Yes, we all have had it. That's called your conscience, right? Yeah. And then when we come to faith, we also have the Holy Spirit, right? So then we doubly know, right, when things are wrong. But even the Gentiles who know, don't have a law yet, they still have a conscience. And that's why God can judge them. He knows he's implanted in them a conscience that they are searing by their actions. They are just ignoring their conscience to do things that they know are wicked, right? So yes, in a sense, they aren't can't be held accountable because there's not a law, but there's still accountability. Well, I should, I'm not saying that they shouldn't be held accountable, right. but I question the discernment that they had yeah. because clearly before them, yeah. they were allowed to say something. Yeah, uh, obviously, yeah. yes, yeah. right, yeah. right. And I think that's part of why God then gives the law, right? He saw how easily men can ignore their conscience and just do wicked things. Um, so anyway, the men rescue um, we take, rescue Lot, who's about to get trampled, and say, we're going to destroy this place. It's verse um, 14 that at the end that talks about how his, his son-in-laws, when he went to get the son-in-laws, they thought he was joking, so he had to leave the son-in-laws. And then he says, flee and don't look back. Who looks back? The wife. The wife. Yeah. And um, there's actually apparently a place, and Sharon, you were there with Anne, that they, they call Lot's wife or something um, by, the Dead, by sea. the Dead Sea. Anyway, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so then they escape. So Lot and uh, now it's just Lot and his two daughters. And what do the two daughters start thinking? No. <laughs> I don't I'm really skip the whole part. thing. Can we just skip this Can we chapter? Just skip this part? It's, it's so disgusting. It's really terrible. Yeah. It's so <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> So there at the end, the daughters decide, well, the only way we can 
how to continue our line is if we have sex with our dad, so they get their dad drunk and they have sex with him. So the older daughter at 37 has a son and names him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites today. Who knows of a famous Moabite that we're going to read about in scripture? Jonah? Not Jonah. Jonah's an Israelite. Ruth. Yeah. One of my very favorites. So she comes out of this incestuous relationship, and it's not going to be a righteous nation. That, and I think all through scriptures we see that, that God judges uh, nations, you know, for their decisions and people groups for their decisions, but he also always sees individuals, yeah. right? He always sees the individuals. He sees those who have a heart for him. Um, so then in 20, Abram blows it again. And uh, he's now it moves to Gerar, and um, anyway, he's afraid about Sarah, so he says, Sarah, say, you know, you're my sister, which happens again. And uh, Abimelech, everything starts going wrong. Abimelech um, finds out, God says to Abimelech, you know, you are doing wrong, right? And so Abimelech's pretty upset. Wouldn't you be upset? Like, why, why didn't you tell me, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, in the end, he decides he's going to, you know, pay him. For, for the problem and then send him away. But I love verse 16. <laughs> Which is funny. You lie to me and I'm going to pay you. Yes, yes right, right. right. But I, lo I love this because listen to what he says. He says to Sarah, Abimelech says, I'm giving your brother a thousand <laughs> Your brother. Right. So anyway, I think that was dripping with sarcasm. All right. So then in 21, finally Sarah gets pregnant. Yay. And uh, she's going to have a son. Um, and so Abraham's 100 years old, and Sarah's 90 when she has uh, Isaac. Um, and, but then Sarah is not happy because um, after Isaac is born, in verse 9, uh, she sees uh, the son of Hagar, Ishmael, uh, mocking um, them. And she says, get rid of that slave and her son. So Abram's distressed. Uh, Ishmael would be about 14, 15 at this point. Uh, Abram's distressed about that, but he, he says, the Lord says, listen to Sarah in verse 12. Uh, do what she tells you because uh, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Um, but I will make the son of the maidservant into a nation as well. Um, so <clears throat> anyway, uh, that happens, and then we get to 22, um, which uh, now a God is going to ask Abram something really difficult. What does God ask Abraham to do? Sacrifice his son Isaac. Now, God is very clear in the scriptures. He is, um, he does not approve of what these other nations are doing in sacrificing their kids on the fire to different idols. So why do you think God would ask such a thing of Abraham? I think that he knew he, and it was a test, but it was a test, but for sure. But he had already told him, "You will be the father of the nations," and he and Abraham had told Isaac, "When we return, you know, it's like he knew." So he knew here's, what wasn't gonna happen. here's what Abraham knew, and it's interesting because we don't find out this until Hebrews. Actually, the author of Hebrews gives us insight into this. Abraham knew that Isaac was the son of promise. And he knew, God had just told him, right, that it's through Isaac that you will be, um, that the nations will come, right? It's through, um, it will be reckoned through Isaac that your off, it will be through Isaac that your offspring is reckoned. Well, Isaac is a boy. We don't know how old he is. Um, some think he's a teenager. He's at least old enough that he can make this trek with his dad, that he can carry the wood, that he has enough intelligence to look at his dad and says, well, we have the firewood and we have the fire, but where is the sacrifice? So he's old enough. He's not like a three or four year old. He's old enough to reason these things. Um, and so apparently Abraham's looking at this and going, okay, I know God promised me. I know I waited a hundred years for this son, right? And now God's asking me to sacrifice it. It's in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verses 17 through 19. That we see that Abraham believed that God had the ability to raise Isaac from the dead. Mm -hmm. That if he was asking him to kill Isaac, God's plan must be to resurrect him, right? Mm -hmm. 
because he knew that God's promise was that it, his, he would have all these descendants and it would be through Isaac. So Abraham, I can't even imagine what kind of a heavy heart that he packed up and took off to the mountain to do this. I have another theory about this, and again, that's just my theory, but I, I think part of the reason God asked him to do this is I think God wanted to know, is there anyone, anyone that would do for me what I will do for them? Because the way he says it, in verse 2 of chapter 22, then God said, take your son, your only son, son. Who you love. whom you love, and sacrifice him there on the mountain. Um, so I think he was looking ahead to what he was going to do. And uh, anyway, it was a test for Abram, it was a hard test. And uh, so Abram, uh, they go up, and I think the answer that he gives to um, Isaac, when Isaac asks about the fire in the wood, which is in verse 7, because Isaac says, Father, you need this picture of this, <laughs> Father, yes, my son, the fire and the wood are here, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And I don't know if any of you have ever listened to Michael Card, but Michael Card has this yeah. amazing song about God will provide a lamb to be offered up in your place, and then he turns it around, so he's singing about us, that God will provide the lamb. I think it's just a picture. I think God wanted to paint a picture um, of what he would eventually do. Kathy, yeah. I was going to say, and this isn't original with me, yeah. I heard that it really shows faith on Isaac's part, too, because right. they said, I, I mean, I heard that he was around 18 years old. Yeah, I don't know. could be. And yeah. here's, here's Abraham, this old man. Yeah, no 100 years old. Forced by, I mean, I right. could have just said. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. bringing that up, Mona. Because down Isaac, down the mountain. Isaac had to trust his dad enough to get up on the altar. You're right. Abraham was too old. You know, Isaac had himself to get up on that altar. And so that showed amazing trust for Isaac, for his father. Yeah, Jennifer. Kind of piggybacking what you were saying about reflecting upon Jesus. Yeah. Did you notice that Isaac carries the wood? Like oh, Jesus just carried, carried the, the cross. cross. Yeah. Oh, I have never thought about that, Jennifer. That's a really good point. I've also heard it suggested that when it came time for God to give his son and turn his back on his son, mm -hmm. Abraham was there. Mm -hmm with him to comfort God mm -hmm. who was willing to mm -hmm. you know feel at least close to mm -hmm. something close to what God was feeling in the moment so that God would have a friend yeah. in the moment mm -hmm. that's a, that's an interesting thought um, and it's moved at the Lord's will yes chapter to think about, but there's beauty in it because of the parallels that we see, right? So, um, anyway, um, sure enough, when Abram goes to sacrifice him, the Lord says, no, stop. Abram, Abram, don't lay a hand on the boy. Um, and sure enough, there's a ram caught by the horns, and um, so he's able to sacrifice the lamb. And then the Lord again confirms his covenant. Um, somebody read 15 through 18. See how many parts of the covenant you can find here. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. All right. So again, what, what do we see? The blessing, the uh, seed, and the land, all three of them. Um, and this is the first time in 18, and he says, and through your offspring. In, Gen in Galatians, Galatians 3.16, the Apostle Paul says in English, we just look at it and we can't tell whether it's plural or singular, but in Galatians 3.16 it says this offspring is singular. 
So what he's saying is not through your offspring, the Jewish people as a whole, he's saying through one particular offspring who's going to come from you, Abraham, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. So um, in uh, just a fun little insight, in 21, we meet us and Buzz. I recommend them for names for your sons. Um, but the only reason I want to point out us and Buzz in verse 21 is because in Job, um, it talks about that Job was from the land of us, and they often named land after the people, right? And that uh, in 32, we find out that one of his friends was a Buzzite, which, you know, so anyway, I'm just saying that it all fits together. It's not like made up names. There are, <laughs> does it your, fits. Does yours say us, U-Z? Yeah. Because mine says us. I said and buzz. Hus? Yeah. Hus. Oh, Hus. Hus and buzz. They're both cute. I think, you yeah. know, if you have twin boys, Hus and buzz. <laughs> <laughs> like a really good one. So, uh, 23, verse 1. Sarah lived to be 127 years old. It is the only one that I read this week, the only woman whose age is ever mentioned in the Bible. How interesting is that? <laughs> um, and then we have the first burial. Sarah dies. First burial, we have the first commercial transaction when Abram buys that plot of land. Um, and then we're just going to skip on to 24. So um, in 24, because we are running out of time here, in 24, um, there's a problem. Here's Isaac's getting older. He's 37 when his mom dies. And um, Abram says, you know what? I, he needs what? Right. He needs a wife, right? And I don't want him to marry one of these Canaanite women. So he's going to send his servant out. And I love how he talks about this. You know, he tells, he, he says, I've got a job for you. And the whole putting your hand under the thigh thing, it, it's got to be a, you know, an aging. <laughs> You're like, really? Yeah, you know? <laughs> I just can't picture anybody doing that today. But it was part of taking an oath. He put his hand under his thigh and he said, I want you to promise me you're going to go. You're going to find a wife for my son. And look at Abram's faith in uh, six. I think his faith has really increased. Somebody read uh, six through eight as Abram's instructing his servant. Make sure that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought him out of my father's household in my native land, spoke to me and promised me an, on, on oath, saying, to your offspring I will give this land, he, I will send his angel before you, so that you can get a wife for the, my son from there. Okay, so he says, listen, I have faith that the God who made this promise to me is going to send an angel before you and going to provide a wife for my son. So the servant goes, and of course he's thinking, how am I going to know? Right? So what does he pray? Have you ever done this? Like you prayed a specific prayer and then saw the God answer fabulously? Right? Mm -hmm. So what does he pray? He prays what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that when I when I get there, right, the woman who not only offers me a drink but offers to water my camels, which would have been a task, right? I'll know that that's the one. So sure enough, Rebecca comes out, she offers him water, then she waters his camels. And he's like, who are you? And finds out it's the relative of his family. So he's found family. And so he knows that God has gone before him and provided this um, wife for um, Isaac. So anyway, it's kind of cute how the story plays out. And she agrees to go. That took faith on her part too, right? I mean, she had a day to think about it <laughs> and say, oh, okay, now I'm moving. I'm leaving my family. I'm going to this place. I'll probably never see my family again to marry this man I've never met took faith on her part. So anyway, so Isaac and uh, Rebecca marry um, in 25, Abraham dies at the age of 175. And we're going to see that the ages get smaller and smaller, starting, you know, from the flood, it gets down to like 500, 400, 300, and pretty soon they're down to remember God said, I'm going to make his lifespan about 120 years. Um, so anyway, um, and then just a little sidelight, in 13 and 14, we meet the 12 tribes of Ishmael. Ishmael has 12 sons, and they become 12 tribal rulers, which is the fulfillment of a prophecy that God made in Genesis 17, 20, and 21. So anyway, that's an interesting sidelight. So Isaac was, in verse 20 of chapter 25, Isaac was 40 when he married Rebekah. And what's wrong with Isaac and Rebekah? Again, they are barren. They have no children. For 20 years, they have no children. And Isaac prays, and God answers. Again, they know. What did God promise? Your descendants are going to be like 
<laughs> so many, and they're having trouble having just one, right? And I think, again, it's just God saying, I want you to see this is from me, right? This is not a natural thing. This is from me. So she gives birth. She has twins. She feels like the babies are at war <laughs> inside of her. Mm -hmm. And then the Lord, uh, she inquires of the Lord. The Lord says to her in 23, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So she gets this prophecy from the very beginning. We're going to see, like Sarah, she tries to help the prophecy along. <laughs> now, we don't have to help God with the prophecy. <laughs> um, anyway, so Isaac, we know it's been 20 years because at the end of 26, it said Isaac was 60. He was 40 when he married Rebecca, 60 when Rebecca gave birth. So we meet these two twins. Esau is the older one. And what do we know about Esau? Hairy. He's hairy. <laughs> hairy. <laughs> He's hairy crazy hairy. hair, right? Comes out hairy, apparently. And then uh, Jacob is. And, and he was who? who? Esau was kind of an outdoors man. He was an outdoors Isaac. man. Yeah. So he was yeah. Isaac's, Isaac's favorite. favorite. Yeah. He was a man's man. Yeah. Isaac Hunter. was partial. It's yeah. not a good thing to be partial yeah. amongst your kids. But we're going to see a lot of dysfunctioning families in yeah. <laughs> here. So he, Isaac loves Esau. Esau's a man's man. J Jacob is a girly man. No. <laughs> a girly oh, man. No. He likes to cook and stay in the yeah. town with his mom. Nothing wrong with that. But they're two very different personalities, yeah. right? Two very different personalities. And Rebecca favors Jacob, right? Yeah. So you have this already. You know there's got to be family tension, right? And then... Um, Esau comes in one day famished from having, you know, hunted, and what does, what does he do? Oh, it's his birthright. Birthright. It's his yeah. And you think about Jacob, who does that? Who asks for a birthright yeah. <laughs> for a cup of soup, right? So you see Jacob is pretty conniving from the get-go, yeah. right? But what about Esau? Selling your birthright for a bowl of stew? You know, you don't feed me now, I'm going to die. So dramatic, right? So anyway... Um, he sells his birthright for a bowl of stew. And then, um, uh, and then we see another little lapse. Well, first in 26, we see that, um, uh, that um, God reiterates the promise to now Isaac in verses uh, 3 uh, through 5. Um, he says, stay in this land for a while. I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands, the land part, and will confirm the oath I swore to your father, Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. I will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, singular, all nations on earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and kept my requirements. So all that to say, he reiterates the whole covenant with Isaac. Right? So he is going to stay faithful to his commitment. So then Isaac gets to, um, it's the same, it's the same yeah. place, right? It's even Abimelech. Some people think it's a junior Abimelech. I don't know. But anyway, yeah. it's the fact that he would try and pull the same stunt, yeah. you know, as Abraham did twice. And, you know, because Rebecca is beautiful, he says, say, you're my sister. And anyway, it's another whole thing. Now fiasco. that's a lie, though, because they're not really. They are not. Yeah. No, no. Whereas Abraham wasn't the lie. Right. Yes. <laughs> it was just on it. They're just, and, you know, amazing. They have such amazing faith on some levels. But I would just say that's true of me. That's probably true of you. I, there have been times I've been able to have amazing faith, and then for another time, like Lori's point, sometimes it's the smaller things or whatever that we we struggle to have faith. So anyway, um, uh, there's a couple times that God appears um, to Isaac. Anyway, and he protects both Rebecca and he protected um, Sarah through that whole, you know, unfortunate <laughs> fiasco. Um, but then in 27, this is crazy, right? So Isaac is old, and there's two important things um, that back in this time, in this culture, the two important things that the oldest son would get was, number one, his birthright. Which he's already sold for a piece of stew. And the other was the blessing. When a father was about to pass, he would call, we're going to see this over and over again, that the father will call his children in, and there's this blessing, and the biggest blessing always would go to the firstborn. So he calls Isaac, is old, he can't see very well anymore, he's getting blind. And he calls Esau and he says, Hey, listen, go kill, find some game, kill it, fix it the way I like it, bring it to me, and then I'm going to give you your blessing. So Esau goes out to do that, but what does Rebecca do? 
So what's she trying to do? She knows what God said. Mm -hmm. The younger, the older is going to serve the younger. younger. But now she's going to try and help that happen, right? Or manipulate. A manipulation. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. <laughs> so um, anyway, I love Jacob's response in 11. Jacob says to Rebecca, his mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man. He doesn't say, yeah. he doesn't say, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> he says, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I'm a man with smooth skin. What if my father touches me and I appear to be tricking him? <laughs> of course, you know, that's what you're worried about, right? So anyway, it, you know, she says, do it. Let the curse fall on me if anything happens. They, they have this whole, I mean, she wraps him up. I mean, somebody last night said, how hairy was he? <laughs> it's not really, really hairy. You know, he got goat skins. Then he puts on a garment that has Esau's, you know, smell on it. She fixes the meat just like he likes it. And Jacob just out now lies to his dad, right? Can you picture this? The father, he goes and he, in 18, he says, my father, that's not a lie. Yes, my son, he answered, who is it? Jacob said, I am Esau, your firstborn. I've done as you told me. All this is all a lie, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he presents the game and Isaac says, well, how did you find it? And right away, Isaac's suspicious. How did you find it so quickly? And, uh, the <laughs> Lord God gave me success. Come on. <laughs> And, it's right off the pen. Oh my goodness. And Isaac says to Jacob, come near so I can touch you to see whether you really are Esau. So he comes near and he says, now the voice is Jacob. See, now Isaac is uneasy about this the whole time. He's like, something doesn't feel right. But when he gets close and he smells them and he feels them, he thinks, okay, you know, this must be Isaac. So he gives him the blessing. And the blessing includes in verse 29 that nations will serve you. Peoples will bow down to you. You're going to be Lord over your brothers. And the sons of your mother will bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed. Those who bless you be blessed. What does that remind us of? The Abrahamic covenant. Right. So he pours out this blessing. And then Esau comes. Jacob. Just, it sounds like Jacob just barely had time to leave before Esau <laughs> appears. Right? And when they realized what had happened, uh, it says Isaac trembled violently in verse 33. I can't even imagine the conversation between Isaac and Rebecca that night. Oh. Or the not conversation. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but it wasn't pleasant. And then uh, Esau finds out, and he is just devastated. Mm -hmm. Not the same as with his birthright, which he seemed to give away without a care. This, he's devastated. Bless me too, my father. Please bless me. So he says, I've really given your brother everything, but he manages to bless him to some extent. And But what do we find out in verse 41? What's Esau planning? Revenge. Says, I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting until my dad dies, and then I'm going to kill my brother. So, uh, Rebecca, who's done all this conniving, says, okay, we need to have a plan B. What are we going to do? So, um, and she um, convinces Isaac to send him away because you don't want to marry these Canaanite women, which Esau had done, and they were very unhappy with that. So they send him away. Um, may God bless you. May you be fruitful. Verse 3 of chapter 28. May your numbers increase. This is Isaac saying... Uh, may you, you know, you, the blessing of Abraham, may that be upon you. So he leaves, um, and God appears, God appears to Jacob three or four times, I think three, but anyway, he, he, his first one is when he's leaving, and picture Jacob, right? He's been like a mama's boy all of his life, and now he's being sent away by himself out into the wilds. He wasn't, you know, yeah. <laughs> a hunter like Esau. I mean, that had to be scary for Jacob, mm -hmm. and God meets him. Uh, God meets him um, just when he is, hasn't gone very far. Um, he meets him, and uh, he has this vision of a stairway up to heaven with angels ascending and descending. And there above it, in verse 13, stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land in which you are lying on. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west and the east and the north and the south, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you, will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. So what is he reiterating to Jacob? Covenant. The Abrahamic covenant. And now we see it's going to come through Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob. Um, and Jacob makes a commitment. He makes a vow. He says, God, if you'll watch over me and bring me back, he says, I will serve you, right? And that's what he does at the end. So let me see if we have time to cover one more, one more chapter. Let's see. 
how far we can get. So he goes, oh, and this is home, we have to do this. So Jacob gets to, um, gets to Haran, um, and they, he finds all these shepherds gathered around this place where they water the sheep. And um, who comes along? Rachel. Rachel. And what does he notice around the way? She's very beautiful. So he like, he moves the stone and he says, here, water your sheep, right? <laughs> and right away, Jacob is smitten. Um, and we find out as it goes on in 16 and 17 that Laban had two daughters. The older was Leah. She had weak eyes, not as beautiful, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel. And when he says, what can, you know, Laban had been talking to him. I don't want you to work for me for free just because you're family. So Jacob says, I will work for seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. And so Laban agrees. Okay, so he works for seven years. And then he's like, listen, my time is completed. Give me Rachel, right, in 21. So they came together to have this feast. And all I can say is there had to be a whole lot of wine being passed around, right? <laughs> and to make a mistake. Like to make a mistake like this, right? And, and I'm sure that um, all, you know, the brides were veiled and, you know, so he couldn't see as he was marrying her. But then, you know, to wake up the next morning and just realize, oh my goodness, I just slept with the wrong woman. <laughs> uh, they had to be hitting the sauce pretty good. So, anyway. And the veil stays on the whole time? No, I know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's, yeah. There's a beer club. But anyway, what you're asking there. And here's the thing that I think is so awesome. You know, it's just like a natural consequence, right? What has Jacob done? He has been so conniving, so deceitful, so manipulative, so hurtful to his brother, to his father, right? And now he's getting what's coming, right? <laughs> what's due him. So, I mean, he's upset. And you can tell, like, it's that whole, like, this sense of ought that we have. Even though Jacob might have been justified to himself what he was doing, he doesn't think Laban has any justification for the yeah. CD, right? When it's done to you, you see that it's not right. Yeah. So, um... Uh, when he says, why have you deceived me? Laban says, well, it's not our custom to give the younger daughter first. So, <laughs> yeah. so here he goes. And, uh, and hey, I'll throw in Rachel too if you'll work for me another seven years. So, oh. anyway. Uh, one, uh, anyway, so he, he does. He works for another seven years. But God saw, again, God, he's the God who sees. He sees that Leah is not loved by her husband. So what does he do for Leah? He blesses her. She has many children. She has one, two, three, four um, boys. And then, oh my goodness, okay, we're going to just finish with this. And so this cracks me up. So she has four kids. Rachel is getting, you know, really upset that Leah has all these kids and she doesn't have any. So she grabs Jacob one day and shakes him and says, give me children or I'll die. That's chapter 30, verse 1. So, yeah. And then Jacob says, am I in God's place? I mean, I'm not the one keeping on door trying, right? So anyway, so then she does what we've seen before. What does she do? She helps God along. Hey, yes. She's going to help God along. Here, here. Here's Bilhah. Take my hands up. So Bilhah has two more boys, Dan and Naphtali. Uh, then Leah is getting jealous because now, you know, now, now Rachel's got two on her side. She's got four. So she says, here, take my maidservant. Can you can imagine what this is like, right? So Jacob and then out. now we see, we see, yeah, we see where this all leads, right? This is why you should only marry one woman. Yeah. So, like, I was talking through these passages with yeah. Scott yesterday, and we're both like, how do you really disciple somebody through that? Because no, no, I mean, like, in the sense that this, this is whom God uses to build His nation. It's almost like, well, what Candace was saying earlier, like, God doesn't. Like the covenant of marriage, the importance of yeah. of of a covenant, like it's just a mockery here, and mm -hmm. like that's a really like we got no answers as we're talking back and forth. Other than we're all sinners, we are all yeah. sinners, and, and God we are all can sinners. still use and us. I just have to tell you that to me it's very heartening because what we learn from Genesis is that God uses fallen people in dysfunctional families <laughs> to accomplish his purpose. And does not that give us hope? Yes. 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 So, you know, but it seems God like is not holding this up as saying, this should be something you emulate. It's just that he is going to, and this is something that we are learning about God. What God is saying is, I am going to be faithful to my covenant, even like you're making 
Jacob a mess, right? Mm -hmm. Seems because like you should have zapped Jacob a little. Yeah, I well, I, a little. I, I, I think he did, yeah. right? When well, he wakes yes. up and he's got Leah, yeah. I'm sure he was thinking, yeah. oh, maybe this is what he's all felt. I don't know, maybe. Yeah. You know? You can't thwart God's plan. And you can't thwart God's plan. Yeah. He no. is going to, and he has made an unconditional covenant yeah, with us through Jesus. Good. And we miss yes. us. You know, oh, <laughs> so yes. anyway, so it's not pretty. God is not saying here, this follow this beautiful example. No, he's he's and he's laying it out the way it was, and it's. And I was thinking too, I was thinking, you know, I guess it's just all this kind of cultural thing about how they did right. things, and like, I guess part of it, yeah, like the time with Lot, it just goes against your grain for you to do a where the women come first, you protect the women first, and if the men die to protect the women, that's what you do. And so the fact that they were willing to protect those two, we think, angels who came to yeah. Lot's place, yeah. they were willing to protect him and, and stick the women, those, those girls out first, that, that, that they're, they're nothing, and to, to protect these two angel men or whoever, yeah. you know. It just goes against. Oh, yeah. And, and it's not being presented as something that's beautiful. It's being presented as something that's twisted. And I think that goes back to Romans 1, which says when we get away from God and God's principles for living, where our thinking becomes futile and it gets darker and darker and darker. And we see that reflected all through scriptures in different places. We're going we're gonna to go on because I just got to finish this one last part because this cracks me up. So, 14, during the wheat harvest, Reuben went out to the fields and found some mandrakes, which were supposed to be like aphrodisiacs. So, he brought them to his mother, Leah, but Rachel says to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But Leah says to her, well, wasn't it enough that you took away my husband? Will you take my son, man, son's mandrakes too? So, but listen to this. So, Rachel says, very well, he can sleep with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes. I'm going to give you permission to sleep with Jacob. Oh, really? And so Jacob comes in from the fields having no knowledge of all this that's been going on between his wives. I tell you that God's plan, one man, one woman, yes. best. Um, so, so Jacob comes in and Leah goes out to meet him and says, you have to sleep with me. I hired you with my son's magic. So I'm just like, how dysfunctional is this family, right? Um, so anyway, but God blesses Leah. She has uh, two more sons. And then finally it says that um, God remembered Rachel. Uh, opened her womb, and she has the fourth patriarch, yeah. which is Joseph. And uh, we're going to get into Joseph's um, Joseph's story next week, but I think we're going to have to stop there. But um, anyway, just interesting, isn't it? I, I, the scriptures is just so fascinating to me, and I love that it's not all polished and cleaned up, right? Mm -hmm. And well, that's what I'm going to read you next week. We're going to get to a part about C.S. Lewis's thing. He, you know, his specialty is literature. And he just says the scriptures do not read like, uh, uh, losing my word again, they, they don't uh, read like a legend. They don't read, read like legends read. Uh, legends don't have this level of detail in them. Legends tend to make the heroes look like they're like superheroes, right? Um, this is just very real. Right? It's very real. It shows all their flaws. It doesn't try and make them out to be something they are not. And we're going to see that they share details that only make sense because they're there. They, they keep, when I read that in C.S. Lewis the first time, I started noticing things that I'd never noticed before. There's all this detail, irrelevant detail. Why would they put it in there? Just because they were there. And they're explaining what they saw. I just, the beauty to me in that is that God honored that original marriage and the, the line, the offspring, the blessed yes. one comes through Leah, the yes. unloved one. Who is the first wife? Oh, very That's beautiful. Good. Very good. That yeah. is beautiful. Yeah. That is beautiful because it is through her son Judah that, mm -hmm. uh, that the Messiah will yeah. come. Very wow. good point. Thank so you for sharing is, that. That's a lovely way to end. Lovely <laughs> end. <laughs> um, hey, Heavenly Father, we are so thrilled that you are a covenant keeping. And we see this covenant you made with Abraham so long ago, thousands of years ago. And it's a covenant that you have remained faithful to. Uh, they have been unfaithful in very many ways, but you have remained faithful and you will remain faithful. This covenant that you made with them has not fully been fulfilled and it will be fulfilled in the future. You've made that clear through your scriptures. So, Father, thank you um, 
that you are a covenant-keeping God, and that's why we can know that the covenant that you made with us through Jesus, that you will keep, even when we fail, even when we mess up, uh, you will keep your covenant to us. We are so grateful for that. Thank you, and thank you for these ladies. It's just a delight to be here together. Thank you for your word, and we pray that as we continue to read, you will just continue to reveal yourself to us. We ask this in Jesus' name.